Hi, and welcome to Dark Window. I'm your host, Jim Mann. Here on this program, I will be talking with many of the leading investigators, researchers, and authors on the topics of UFOs, UAPs, alien abductions, extraterrestrials, and a host of many other fascinating and related topics. So please join me and my guest for the next hour as we reach out. This is Dark Window on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jim Mann, your host, and this is Dark Window. Today, I have a special guest in the studio with me. His name is Dr. Robert Farrell. I've known uh, Dr. Farrell for quite a number of years. Um, He's a fascinating gentleman. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. He has a master's degree in business administration, and he has a doctor of engineering. He spent 15 years as a professor of engineering at Penn State University. Now, Dr. Farrell has had a very keen interest in the UFO phenomena for, well, most of his life. Uh, And he has done extensive research and study himself throughout the years. And so please join me as we welcome uh, Dr. Robert Farrell. And Bob, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Jim. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, and I'm I'm so happy to have you with us here on the show. Um, I've got this new book in my hand that you gave me a couple of weeks ago, The Science Behind Alien Encounters. Uh, Patricia and I, the our, my program manager, who is behind the scenes here, plopping up all the slides, and, um, she's been reading it, and I've read a little bit of it, and we've been looking at a few documentaries online. Uh, regarding some of the some of the stuff that's in this book, uh, this book is filled with all sorts of in, uh, fun stuff and very interesting. But what I want to talk about today is Chapter 16, the Nazca lot or the Nazca mummies, and you're involved in that a little bit. And I know you have a, a presentation here that you'd like to share with us. Yes. So if we can get that presentation up. There it is. Okay, there it is. And so, uh, Dr. Farrell, what can you tell me, or how could we start off this conversation about the the Nazca uh, mummies? I almost said Nazca dummies. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what I can tell you is, is uh, how I got drawn into it. Yeah, uh, please do. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. I happened to be attending. That's this slide kind of indicates uh, where I started in this whole thing. I, I was attending a uh, Starworks USA 2017. Uh, that it's run by Paula Harris um, in you know, Nevada, and Jaime Masson uh, was giving a, his a presentation, which was the first time actually in the United States that uh, anyone had heard anything at all about what they would refer to as mummies uh, that they had found out in Peru. And, and, and I, actually, they weren't mummies. So let me just, they were, they're actually bodies because they still had all their organs. And uh, the thing that got my, really piqued my interest was the fact that they, that there's two species and uh, they are, both species are bipedal, and tridactyl and the tridactyl got my attention because i I started counting if you tridactyl how many digits digits do you have and it turns out they have 12. and i had done quite a bit of research uh, into the sumerian culture in preparation for for my book the science behind noah's flood and i knew 12 was a very uh, significant and important number for the sumerians and so i was trying to connect was with uh, these these bodies did they represent perhaps the anunnaki that the uh, sumerians believe had come to earth about 450,000 years ago and, and maybe that's why the sumerians thought uh, so highly of 12 is because their gods or whatever you call them had 12 digits and so that that hooked me right there that got me involved and um so I, I was always trying to connect with, uh, let me see if this, there we go. Um, so, and the Sumerians, it turns out, have other connections that appear to be Sumeria. And what I'm showing in this picture right here is uh, a bowl that was dated to be over 5,000 years ago. It was found in Bolivia and it had been that, used. 
Yeah, excuse me. Yes. Bob, that is a fascinating point because that that is cuneiform, correct? It, yes, it's a form of cuneiform, and which was invented was by the Sumerians. In, and it was found in Peru. No, actually, it was found in Bolivia, right next door. Okay, Bolivia. Yeah, but it, it was, was uh, a farmer had been using it to water his goats, you know, so he didn't recognize it. I don't know how someone discovered, hey, look at that's pretty important. Look at the writing. Anyway, so it turns out that uh, uh, a lot of people make this uh, the bull connection with the Sumerians, even though it was supposedly 5,000 years old, uh, you know, before we had airplanes and things to mm -hmm. fly back and forth and, and uh, establish a connection. Uh, so, so that kind of reinforces, in my mind anyway, that there may be a connection between uh, Peru and Bolivia too uh, and Samaria. And, and thousands so, of miles apart. Thousands of miles apart. And so I actually uh, approached Jaime and, and asked him if I could kind of tag along, you know, drop in from time to time on the phone call and see what's going on with these bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and he also gave me permission to use a lot of the images that he had his, in his presentation. So you'll see those today. But uh, so the discovery of these bodies actually began, they were discovered in 2015 and uh, by grave robbers. And they, I think, sat on for a while trying to figure out what to do. Normally, grave robbing is illegal. It still is in, in uh, Peru. It's a lucrative business, but if you get caught, you could go to prison. And so they weren't sure what to do, I guess. And, and they brought some bodies or parts of the bodies to Thierry Jamin, who ran a, the archaeological institute in Cusco. And they, they brought it to him, asking him how, you know, whether he thought they were real. And here's the story right here. They didn't bring them to him until October of 2016, even though they discovered him in 2015. And Mario was the pseudo name. Uh, that's not his real name, but he was a hukero. And he brought him to a theory to, to find out if they were real. And um, Mario indeed, uh, I mean, uh, theory did examine them. And after examining them, thought, yes, they are real. Um, in fact, probably historic. So he had to do two things in his mind. Number one, he wanted to try and get the scientific community involved in these bodies. So he posted these, some of the images on the internet, hoping that someone would bite and connect. Um, and the other thing he did in January of that year, uh, because he didn't want to be caught with these bodies and, and go to prison for, for smuggling or having stuff that was taken out of a grave, supposedly. Uh, so he even wrote a letter to the Ministry of Culture claiming that he had these bodies in his possession and that where they had been found near uh, uh, Nazca. And uh, he thought they were um, probably a national treasury and he wanted this declare, he wanted them to be declared as a national treasury uh, so that uh, they'd be protected, um, not only from the environment, but from being sold off to some uh, collectors. There are wealthy collectors on this planet that might swoop in and uh, buy some of these things for their own collection. And then they wouldn't be uh, available to do research. So that was what theory was trying to do. And uh, I guess no one seemed to be interested. Certainly the archaeologists uh, in Peru uh, had been turned off on the whole project. They had been made to believe that these bodies were, were fake, that they were assembled from cadaver bones, and they wanted nothing to do with it. And so I think that was a deliberate effort by the Ministry of Culture to, to taint this whole thing, uh, to discourage people from wanting to, to spend millions of dollars or whatever to buy any of these things because they were fake. And anyway, it turns out that uh, what happened, that uh, a, uh, I'm, I'm not going to read this exactly the way it's written, but uh, there was a biologist. In fact, I believe, I don't really know who, who he is for sure, but I think he was the biologist that came with Jaime in uh, when they came down in April to uh, Peru. But he had seen those on the internet and he contacted Jaime. He, knew, he was a good friend with Jaime and said, you know, it, it appears as though those it might be real. You really should take a look at it. And so what Jaime did was contact Theory and uh, by 
either internet and, or phone, and through discussions, uh, was convinced that uh, yes, there, there may be something here. And so he then contacted Gaia, and some of you may know who Gaia is, but Gaia uh, agreed that yes, it looks like they might be important, and uh, they agreed to help fund a, a task force, if you would, of, of uh, ad investigators, a lot of which scientists, to go down and look at these bodies. And so they did. <clears throat> so here's the people that were on the team. Um, and I have a complete list with me if, if uh, one has a question on that. But it was, it was a cross cut of uh, a lot of people who might be important to, to, to see these bodies firsthand. And biologists, of course, was there. There was a surgeon and uh, a radiologist, an archaeologist, a forensics expert, some videographers and other journalists were there too. Um, and they came from all over. And then not all the people who ultimately did the investigation for the, this whole period of a couple of years it's going to take to go through all this. But they uh, they didn't all go to Peru. So some contributed uh, from their own location, like in the United States or France even, uh, where samples would be sent to them or, or pictures would be sent to them. And so that's how they contributed. But the, uh, the excuse me, the gentleman yeah. from Russia, the, the, yeah. the uh, scientist from Russia, he went down to Peru, correct? Yes. Dr. Karatkov was one of the uh, first team, went down with the first team. That is quite a, I mean, that's quite a team they've assembled there, quite a diverse bunch of folks. It was, uh, yes. Um, and even Canada, Canada did not. That work was done in Canada. Uh, so samples were sent to him, and they did some of the DNA work. Um, but th there were uh, the people that actually went there were, uh, you know, the biologist and, and Jaime from Mexico. In fact, I have my list here. But uh, let's see who else. From, oh, also, there was a. Um, um, let's see here. The, the uh, one of the other people that was there was uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Doctor uh, Benitez, Benitez. I'm sorry, Benitez. Doctor Benitez, Dr. who Benitez. happened to be a forensics expert uh, for the for the Mexican Navy, and uh, so he was an important part of the team to do an initial survey of the bodies, <coughs> and you know what he thought. This is before they had X-rays you know, initially just looking at the bodies as they were. And the bodies were coated in this white substance, which turned out to be diatomaceous earth. And apparently it had been blended with some oil so it would stick to the body. That so, was an interesting aspect is that these, these skeletons, these mummies, they were more or less mummified in this diatomaceous earth. They were, um, they were preserved because diatomaceous earth is also a desiccant and yes, and, it's used for a lot of a lot of things, including swimming pool filters and. Yeah, it's a fungicide uh, too. Yeah, uh, fungicide. So it's an excellent uh, way to preserve the bodies, and the bodies were not actually mummified. Uh, they referred to as mummies earlier on, but uh, even the, on the first lecture that Jaime gave that I saw, he was clear to say that these weren't mummies because they did not contain any of the internal organs. Therefore, uh, the government had no right to claim that they had robbed a grave. You know, because that. That, that, that would not, you, you don't want right. to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Uh, so, they're not, they're just the bodies. They're, they're, they're dead people that used to live. So, they're, they're not um, mummies. And uh, that kind of put that to, to bed anyway. Yeah. Uh, but it's sometimes I refer to them as the mummies just because everybody knows who I'm, what I'm talking about when I say that. Right. Yes. So, um, let me just go to the next slide here. So the initial story, as far as where where they were found, of course, the grave robbers really never did, as far as I know, reveal really where they found them for obvious reasons, because apparently there were there were more and, and they were worth a lot of money. Um, but the first story that they told uh, theory was that they had been uh, exploring a grave and somehow found themselves in a stairway going down into the ground. And when they got to the bottom of the stairs, they saw a door and they pried the door open and they found themselves in a room 
and there there were sarcophagi and they they looked in the sarcophagi and they found these bodies so that was the story that they gave that's that's how they came about the bodies um later on they had to change their story and i think it was maybe a couple years later before they actually agreed to take some of the members of the team out to where they 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 now claim that they found the bodies and it was in a rugged area you can see that uh, they had to climb sort of climb a mountain to get yeah, to that's, that that's pretty it, rugged it turned out it was it was basically a cave and here's a picture of looking inside the cave right uh, you can see the hand there it's got the white powder on it so what what was explained to them while they were in this cave was each of the areas that appeared to be carved out or something where the, there could have been a body in there. And so that was all pointed out to them. Well, this is where we found this body. And over here is where we found this body. And uh, so it certainly it didn't fit the image that they were initially given as far as being a tomb. Yeah, right. But uh, and, the, Of course, the, this was all filled with that diatomaceous earth. Yes. So it kind of matched. And, and also some of the researchers said, that, well, it smelled in here just like uh, in the cave. It smelled the same as what they were smelling when they handled the bodies. Correct. Yeah. So that kind of connected it. Um, so in Cusco, the first meeting was April of 2017. And, when, and the, the team was actually shown certain bodies initially. And, and one of them, first ones that they showed them were, uh, were hands. Here I have a picture of the hands, which are unusual. Um, you can see they're tridactyl and uh, very long. And now, if you look at your finger, you can see uh, you've got three three bones, more or less. And these guys have, and they call them phalanges. Phalanges. These, these hands and also the bodies, not, no, I shouldn't say that. The bodies don't all have the five phalanges. But uh, these hands were five phalanges and uh, almost 12 inches long. So you can imagine how long your hand would look if it was 12 inches. Dr. Farrell, what do we know about this, this metal part here? This? Yeah, well, uh, that they didn't know for sure what it was until they had an analysis done on it. But one of the things they did know right off the bat was it was non-magnetic and okay. appeared like it might be copper. And in, indeed, the uh, final analysis on that was that it was a mixture uh, that included copper uh, and it appeared to be something that could have been done by uh, uh, people in that in that part of the country uh, or that world that, that back, let's say, a couple thousand years ago. They would have had the technology to, to, to make that whatever you want to call that thing. Mm hmm. So I think they're still trying to figure out exactly what it, the purpose is. And was what it was that do. was that sort of an implant inside? Yeah. It was is right implanted right in the skin. Okay, okay, right on top wow. of the hand. All there right. was two of them, uh, and they were each one was a little different color. So I think one was a little uh, more reddish, and one was gold, gold oh. colored. So. Um, here you can see there's three hands there and the one closest uh, had a chunk taken out of it. And of course that was done. To, so they have stuff to send off for an analysis, but, uh, these, these have been x-rayed and, and, uh, looked at, uh, I don't know about co computer tomography, but they've certainly been looked at through x-ray. And here is a, an artist. There was a graphic designer. Uh, Jose Hernandez, who uh, did a good job of, and you'll see when we look at the other bodies, eventually toward the end of the talk, I will show you uh, what his interpretation of, of the bodies would be if they were living, you know, and, uh, and this is a good picture here because it shows how you don't need to have a thumb to grab onto something. When you can wrap your hand with all those fingers, you can wrap right around it with your fingers. That's a very good point because I thought yeah. about that when I saw that. Yeah. But yeah, with all the phalanges they got, they can just yeah. grip something. They, they don't need the, really, they don't need the opposing thumb. That's right. That's right. And, you know, when I was growing up uh, in, in school, I don't know what point, maybe high school or biology, uh, that was supposed to be a feature of a, 
intelligent being, someone one that has a an opposing thumb, so that they yeah. could make things, you know, make yeah. tools. And uh, so that kind of shoots that theory. Absolutely. They were also were presented with some heads, and my first reaction when I saw those was was that they were monkey heads. You know, they look like they might have come off of a monkey. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when they inspected them, they noticed that the, the connection on the bottom was a square hole, which is very unusual because most animals, um, it's a round hole for where for maybe this for the uh, nerves and everything to pass down. So that made them a little bit unusual. And I think I might have another picture here. Yeah, that's an x-ray of one of the heads. And you'll see other pictures of the, the heads of some of these bodies. And the, it's clear that they don't have any teeth. That's one thing. The other thing that's clear is the, the uh, capacity for, for holding a brain in, in, uh, as a function of, and compared to the size of the body is, is pretty large. And like you'll see Marie a little later, and uh, it was estimated that her, her cranial capacity was 20% greater than a human's in the human uh, and she was maria was about the same size as a human but they had the sort of the elongated skull though yeah well you can right. see the head you can see the back yeah. of the skull is kind of elongated hooded you could say even and i, I think we'll see that too this is looking at kind of inside the the capacity of the skull um and where the arrows are pointing is is assumed where the nerves would come down through that hole like it would in most animals. Yeah. And then they were finally brought, uh, presented with two bodies. They had been given a, a previous body, but it looked so fake and it turned out that it was. It was more like a doll that had been assembled from bones. And so they, you know, they, once they saw the x-ray, they, they put it on the shelf and forgot about it. They were not interested in it. But these bodies, these two here, uh, they, they were called Marie's, excuse me, Maria and, I mean, Josefina and Alberto. Let me go back. Oops. Yeah. Alberto and Josefina. And uh, so we'll look a little closer at it, but notice their necks, how long they are. Um, Alberto's a little longer than J Josefina's, at least at, at this point. Mm -hmm. And the, when they examined real closer, it, it looked as though they could actually extend and, and retract their neck, kind of like a turtle. And if you saw um, E.T., I think it was, I was e. gonna say, it looks like E.T. Yeah, E.T. could do that. I don't yeah. know. Steven Spielberg must have known about this because I, I would never have thought to depict a, an alien alien with a, a, an extendable neck, but um, he did. <laughs> and yeah. sure enough, they think these. these Maybe he had a little inside information or something. Yeah. I don't know. Well, the, the, just looking at the bones and the, the, the structure, it looked like they could be extended. And the, the skin on these is, is very unusual. It's I, uh, some of the other images that I've seen, and I think I have one a little later here. But uh, it reminds me of in, during in, when we have Thanksgiving. I'm usually the one that has to prepare the turkey and uh, salt it down, and you know, rubbing the skin. It, it, the skin looks a lot like a turkey skin to me, but the, the, a lot of people call it rep reptilian-like skin. But, but it's not human looking skin anyway. No, it's not. Here's an x-ray now of those two bodies uh, with their heads, because uh, one of the bodies they got later on was without a head. But yes, their heads match kind of the ones that they were given earlier. And again, clearly they have no teeth and they don't seem to have an ability to chew. And one of the first assumptions was that uh, perhaps uh, they lived on a liquid diet that they could take in through their small mouth. Hmm. Now go back to that a minute. Now there's something, there's something there on Josephina that's down around uh, yes. the neck. That's yeah. Uh, it it, it happens to be a plate that's on her chest. We'll see that later. Um, okay. And, and that's, that's an interesting topic because that plate is made out of metal. And it was uh, wh whoever uh, implanted it on her uh, certainly had good surgical technology. And if these bodies, by the way, were, were uh, dated to have died approximately a thousand years to eleven hundred years ago. And uh, did they have technology to do that kind of surgery back then? Um, 
I don't know. I, Certainly not according to our understanding today. Yeah, that's right. And here we're looking down into the uh, vault, if you will, where the brain would be. And it's in the center, more or less. Hmm. So here's a picture that points out a lot of the things that we, you were looking at. Yeah. Um, the extendable neck, you can see that. They they have uh, a, this is a, this is a picture of uh, uh, Josephina, and it turns out Josephina is female, and she has eggs, and you can see three very quickly, but a more detailed analysis shows there's still another fourth egg that's uh, in the fallopian tube, and, uh, and so basically she has four eggs there that she's working on. Um, the metal plate that you you talked about, Jim is in her chest and you can see on the side you can see on the side view too the uh the other thing that's interesting about these guys is their bone structure uh, they only have a single bone in their forearms and four legs and, um, like we have two bo two bones you know in our forearm uh, they only have one and uh so that makes them unique the bones are hollow too that's another thing uh, that sets them apart from most animals that we have. They uh, only had 11 vertebrae, vertebrae, and the thoracic cage is, you can see, the, you, you look at it from the side view, you say, well, how can they have any internal organs in there? There's no space for it. And right, then, yeah. Yeah. Well, later on, you'll see that they, they don't. <laughs> They're well, very limited what's inside there. Let me ask you this. The fact yeah. that there is eggs inside of that Josephina. Yeah. Which would mean that she would not give birth, live birth, and that would not, that she would not be a mammal. Right. She That's would right. be definitely a, a reptile or bird-like or something. Yeah. Uh, here we see a picture of a frog. I, I, I put this one here just to point out uh, how similar those small bodies, and, and one we're talking about now is the small one. You haven't seen the big one yet, but the small bodies are about two feet tall, uh, and they appear to be very frog-like. I mean, from the point of view of their, their fact that their skin, uh, the fact that uh, they're not mammals, and uh, their bone structure is similar to a frog. Wow. Uh, however, the DNA that they've done, they've never been able to match any of the DNA of those of that species to any anything in the database it doesn't match frogs turtles people uh alligators sunflowers wheat or anything no match at all to anything that they have it seems to be a new species of some sort yeah uh def definitely not a normal species on planet earth yeah i happen to think they're not from this planet anyway but we'll get to that yeah, later well, i guess yeah. I'm say that's that's an option in it uh it is uh, and I think many of the people down there in Peru also think that they're aliens. They're, they're not, you know, from this planet. So I'm not alone there. Now, here's here's a computer tomography image of, of uh, this has to be Josephina because there's the eggs, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look closely, you, can, you can't make out too much as far as what's inside in terms of organs. Um, and the other... Other images that have been taken of this do not reveal any evidence of a, of a heart, lungs, or even a digestive system. And uh, so that's perplexing because how do they survive? I guess that would be a question. And uh, let me see. I'm not, I got to look and see what my next slide here. Oh, well, before I get to that, here's a family of more bodies that were, were presented, but. Before I leave this one, I want to say what I my my take on this. Uh, in my research so that I, over the years, uh, in reading both stories of people who were abducted and what they experienced, uh, mostly that, and and mm -hmm. I can't even point to when in my readings because I've been doing this for at least three decades. Uh, someplace along the line, I I I had heard or read by someone who apparently. Uh, was with a, what they call gray. I call these the grays that uh, that they don't eat, that they immerse themselves in a fluid 
and they take in their uh, energy, you might call it, or nutrients transdermally through their skin. And uh, cool. so, so I think that's that amazing. We, I think that's what we're looking at here is, is a, a species that does not eat, but absorbs um, through their skin. And that forced me to do some research into frogs because they do resemble frogs to a lot of extent. And I, I only recently learned that frogs can breathe underwater in the sense that they transpire. They can take in oxygen through their skin and, and expel carbon dioxide through their skin. So when they're below the ice in the, in the wintertime, maybe buried in mud or something, uh, hibernating, you might say, uh, they can still absorb oxygen through their skin. And I think that's what these guys do, but they also take in nutrients and uh, through their skin. And I heard a story recently by someone uh, that they had been talking to another person who they trusted, who used to work in Area S4, which some people may recognize that that's near Area 51. Right, yeah. And uh, that that person who was almost matter of fact was explaining how they had received a living alien from a crash apparently and they had a dilemma because it didn't eat it could not eat had no way to eat and so they were trying to figure out how to keep it alive and so they came up with the idea of basically plastering the skin with a, uh, a high protein uh, like peanut butter or something i don't know maybe that's what it was and yeah. that's how they kept it alive so oh. So my bottom line is I believe these, these guys, uh, they're certainly unique. It uh, hasn't been proven that they, they're alien, although they don't match anything on our earth. And that, uh, I believe that they do take in everything they need transdermally. Transdermally. Yes. I have heard that before regarding to, with other people who yeah. have experienced um, episodes and and with so-called grays and they said that uh, they said the same thing about the grays that they they don't eat they don't yes. drink they it, everything is transdermally so yes that was something that over over the years that i had been told yeah uh, and uh, that, that's kind of what i heard in fact uh in my novels even though there's science fiction i try to be as accurate as i can uh, um i i mentioned that they were one of my characters was accidentally abducted and he was given a tour. And as they were on the tour, uh, a gray walked by. And so the, the human who had been abducted questions his abductor, who, who's, who's a friend, you know, the reason he, mm -hmm. he, he, uh, he would almost answer any questions because he, he was going to re erase the memory when they let, let the human go. But, but he was telling the human that, uh, uh, no, they don't, they don't eat. They, they submerge himself. In a flu. It's kind of a good idea because you don't overeat that way, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know, you know, when you think about these guys, what did they do running around Peru? Did yeah. they, did they uh, have access to peanut butter or <laughs> what did they do? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, those are things we think about, correct? Yeah. I just, so, uh, I, I, I'm amazed at this whole study, this, all these not mummies. These are these were living creatures at one time. They were living beings. Yes. With obvious, obviously, they were intelligent, sentient beings just by the size of their brains. And yeah, I mean, that's right. This, and, this uh, is amazing stuff. I use these characters in my fourth novel, where they're actually uh, taking care of a mothership, and uh, they're grown. Mm -hmm. so like you would grow chickens. When I say grown, they they're raised like chickens, but they're highly yeah. intelligent, and they they run around. And they take care of the ship, the mothership. Um, yeah. And and in fact, I even have them interconnected uh, mentally to to the mainframe of the computer, not not by wire, but uh, Wi-Fi, let's say. And well, so they, they all basically are locked together. Yeah, well, uh, Doctor Farrell, could could this be the Greys? Could this I be? Think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact. Uh, yeah. A species oh. thereof? Yeah, uh, I think so. I'll, I'll show you a picture of my, the cover of my book, and I'll tell you that story. And, and yeah. their grays. Yeah, we have to keep moving. We're down to. Uh, oh wow! To okay, just about twenty I was minutes. I'm get done too fast here. Yeah. So these are the what they call the family, but they're the same species, and um, 
they assumed that the, the, the biology would be the same. And this is the tridactyl Victoria without a head, but same species. Same species. Um, yeah. Uh, and here is what these uh, forensic uh, graphic designer would say that they look like when they're walking. Well, that around. looks pretty much like a gray to me. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say I've never actually seen one, but um, yeah. Yeah, but if you look, I think my next picture. Yeah, I've got That's a statue. Cover. I've got a statue of one right there behind me. <laughs> oh, one corner. of these? You got oh, one of these in the corner? You see back behind me there? Oh well, I got two of them up on mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so you I, know, yeah, this is this is all based on on you know witness testimony and yeah, exactly. Uh, over I, thousands of cases. I had just finished writing this book. And I was working on the cover and I was at a UFO conference when um, in the hallway, somebody was selling these bus and I and it came in a box. So I bought it one, took it home, thinking I would digitize it and make my cover. But yeah. then uh, I, I noticed the website was on the, the box. So I went on the website and that is the website right there. So right. I immediately okay. contacted the the owner of the, the who's actually the artist. Uh, and I, I asked him, I said, can I have permission to use this? And he said, sure. So I gave him some a little money and I have the rights to use this image. And uh, I asked him, well, how did you come about that? And he said, well, uh, he said, I, I contacted about 12 people that he somehow he knew they had, had been ex had experience in contacting or seeing the greys, either because they were abducted or whatever. And so he asked them to send him a sketch of what they he thought they they thought they looked like, and then he took those twelve uh, drawings and um, made three different composites to blend them all together, and then sent them out and asked them to vote. And this is the one that they selected as this is looking what they most selected. like what they experienced. And amazingly, these guys, the, the, these bodies we just looked at, you could see that uh, that's what they could look like, very close. So that was kind of amazing for me, and because this I did this cover back in 2004, long before they uh, discovered these bodies. So here now we get to Maria. Yeah, Maria, to Maria is, she's also a tridactyl, um, and bipedal, and very human looking. In fact, if she stood up, she'd be a little over five feet tall. She also had all of her organs almost. There were some that she lost because they, they believe she was attacked by a large cat in, the, in her buttocks. Uh, but other than that, um, uh, and she also had about 20% more brain capacity, it's, it's volume in her brain, in her skull anyway, for the brain. So she, mm -hmm. she probably was maybe t pretty intelligent. Uh, they dated her to have died about 1,750 years ago. No. And they use carbon dating for that. And if I have time, I'll talk now, more about that. Yeah. When, do we, when do we think the Nazca lines showed up? Uh, they, that's dated at 1,700 years ago. About that same time. Yeah. So that is about the same time that, that supposedly she died. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a question about that, and we'll get to it hopefully in a minute or two, uh, about the carbon dating process and uh, how it may not even be valid for this particular situation. Right, but uh, the the DNA on her though does match about twenty five percent human, but no no modern human DNA, but human DNA in general. Uh, so she was twenty five percent after the after the testing. They so this is a uh, something similar. Yes, but not similar. I mean, yeah. No, the, this is, this the is one amazing. thing these guys are. I think their DNA would be considered ancient DNA by people who, who do a DNA, DNA analysis. And, it, and it's, uh, I don't think that science is fully developed yet because it, uh, uh, there's a lot of question. But anyway, uh, DNA does, does not last forever. It deteriorates for various reasons. Uh, and so therefore, when you're looking at something, you might think there's a couple thousand years old. Mm -hmm. uh, there's certain skill involved in, in being able to remove what they call the ancient DNA and isolating the, the DNA that they really want to look at. So, and I don't know the process beyond that, but I just know that uh, there's always a question about these things. Right. Uh, now, Maria, these are slices done with the computer tomography, and they could clearly see that she had a heart and lungs and uh, digestive 
system and uh, also the next slide in her intestines they discovered uh, oh, feces, what like yes. feces and, and to me that is one of the most important parts of, of this whole discovery because um they really need to carbon date that feces because that feces li probably lived its whole life whatever it was on earth and it would be uh, valid to use carbon 14 dating methods on it however carbon 14 dating only works if uh, if you make the assumption that whatever you're dating spent its whole life on earth and uh we i'm not going to make that assumption that maria lived her whole life on earth so oh well, that's a good point too to think about well, i mean here's yeah. why this is uh shows how carbon 14 is created and it's created in the upper atmosphere by high energy particles mostly probably from our sun <clears throat> And when these high energy particles strike uh, nitrogen 14, which is, you know, like our atmosphere is at least 80% nitrogen, um, that it converts that to carbon 14, which is radioactive. And that means it has a half life of about 5,730 years. And so this carbon 14, you know, will settle down and mix with the atmosphere below. And uh, you have a certain ratio between carbon 14 and carbon 12 and they know that ratio and, and it varies a little bit from place to place and even from time to time but they have good records on that so mm -hmm. once you're trying to do a carbon dating you can refer to that table and you know adjust your data but um the thing is if if uh, maria had not lived on earth all her life maybe she lived someplace where this process for creating carbon 14 did not exist either there was not a lot of nitrogen or uh, not a lot of radiation maybe where she lived and so she wouldn't have that much carbon 14 to begin with even if maybe none maybe all the carbon 14 she got was for the few years that she might have actually been on earth and therefore her ratio of carbon 14 to 12 would be lower and when you do the carbon 14 dating to her uh, you might come to the conclusion that she's older than she really is now, what really makes this interesting is in the same area where they found um, Maria, they found a baby, baby Wawita, they called her. I'm not sure. I think I have a slide there. Well, that's that's her. Later on, I'll show you Wawita. It's a baby that was found near Maria. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wawita also was initially looked like it was tridactyl, but it, they found out later that it, it, the baby originally had... Uh, five digits and the two had been removed to make it look like tridactyl. Now I'm not sure why that would have happened, but th that's the way it was. And that baby was dated to have died 670 years ago. Now the baby was less than a year old. So I think that would have been an accurate dating. Now, what if, if they happened to do, do a carbon dating of the feces in Maria and find out that actually Maria died by 6, 670 years ago? Uh, then that could connect the Wawita, who they initially thought was her baby, and maybe this would show that the baby really was hers, and that Maria uh, only, you know, was not did not die 1,700 years ago, only died 670 years ago. And so it may be that by comparing the skin dating of her, which dated to 1,700 or so, with skin and other tissue taken from her, to the mm -hmm. true age of her of 670, you could perhaps even calculate when she might have arrived on this planet. That's my theory anyway. Right. Here's looking inside of her, and you, she really does have almost all of her organs, uh, except for like in her butts. Um, had, that's where she was bitten, and she died. They think that's what caused her death. She bled to death. Oh. This is her. She does have teeth. Okay, I, I don't see canines necessarily indicating that she might be a meat eater, but uh, she does have teeth. And maybe someone who knows more about that could look at those teeth and say, no, she was a, a herbivore. <laughs> you know, she, she I mean, they grass. look like a normal hominid herbivore. Yeah, yeah she got molars and everything. Yeah, she, right. I don't know what happened. She's, she maybe should have seen her dentist because it looks like she lost some of her teeth. <laughs> but Now, uh, you say that her cranial cavity is is larger than the normal yes yes what about and the eye socket? 
the uh, well, they're bigger. The iPod uh, socket is bigger, and I, I'll show you another picture that's done by the forensic artist yeah. in a minute. Uh, but she had she had holes for her ears where we would have holes, but there are no what do you call these things that stick out? She didn't have any of those. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you'll see that. There we go. You can see. I don't know if we, is, is my cursor showing up on the screen. Uh, your cursor is not showing up. No. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, if you look at the side view of her head, you can you can see there are holes there for I'm her. Right. Um, can you see my cursor? Probably not. No, I cannot. But, no. but I see the small hole on the side of her head there. And, right, and she her eyes think, were a little large too. Yeah. Um, you know, compared to us, larger than ours. Uh, otherwise, on the other image that you can see that, that where she's standing up. Uh, except for her toe, her toes look awful long, and so do her hands hanging down there. Um, but if, if she didn't show her hands and feet and walked around and maybe wore a cap over her ears, <laughs> you wouldn't really know that she's not human. Well, you know, and then we would have no way of knowing what sort of heightened sensory perceptions uh, this this person, this creature would have. Maybe she doesn't have the big ears. Right. But maybe she has other ways of of interpreting the her environment uh, who knows yeah you know i want to go back here a minute uh you know i've been meaning to take a close look at this or ask somebody cuz does she have vocal cords she has lungs oh yeah well good does she point. have vocal cords can she speak and that i mm. don't know that's yeah. uh, on my bucket list then to find out more about this person. That's a yeah, that's a good one, Bob. Yeah, yeah. I I, I didn't think about that when I saw this yeah. earlier. Huh? Yeah, and, you're right. And in the in the skull cavity there, you can see something that looks it looks like it was left over of her brain. <laughs> yeah, there's you, there's a if substance you study in closely, there. Yeah, if if yeah, if you study it closely, it's a dehydrated dehydrated brain. I think dehydrated I brain. It doesn't certainly fill out the whole cavity which it probably did originally. But, uh, yeah. Now, like I said, at the very beginning of this whole um, research, the, the team, the effort really was to show that these bodies were not assembled. And clearly these images, they didn't have these to begin with. They had uh, some other ones, you know, x-rays and things. But right. clearly these com computer tomography images show without a doubt that these bones were not assembled, that they, they're connected with connective tissue. Huh. And uh, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but on this other species, the short guys that are two feet long, right. uh, their joints, where we would have a ball and socket joint, there's a con connective tissue there that's kind of like a sponge. So it can bend in, okay. in more dimensions. And, you know, we have like one degree of freedom as, as we, we move our own arm back and forth. Right. Uh, but we can't, other than twisting the whole arm, you can't really um, uh, do, you know, go sideways. And I think the small species probably had a little more mobility in their joints than, than we might because the, the uh, they weren't, it wasn't a ball and socket joint. It was a kind of a spongy type material. Yeah. Well, Dr. Farrell, we, we're down to about three or four minutes here. Um, okay. What? Oh, what there's Louisa. Find? There's the baby. Yeah. Yes. And and I think, like I said, I think the top of the list, that I, if I were to talk to those guys down in Peru who are doing this research, I said, whatever you do, if you don't do anything else, carbon date uh, the feces in um, Maria, because that will tell you a lot. Oh, here here I am. That yeah. is Maria in the back. Now, she's much bigger than that in real, in real life, but... I'm in a hallway looking through a window into a room and she's in a box in that room, which I was told is filled with argon gas. So she's preserved because that's one of the big concerns is that they, the bodies will degrade with time. Wow. Uh, there's my books. There's your books. So we timed it right. We sure did. And you've, um, you've done a lot of research over the years. Um, I know we had you uh, present, I believe it was the science behind Noah's flood at the Phoenix MUFON meeting several, two, three, four years ago. Um, 
Yeah, I, th I think it was. I'm not sure, though. I'd have to yeah, look at my so records. I can tell the listening audience that the, the book that I have here, that uh, right here, and that's the science behind the alien encounters. Um, I love this, the science behind series, Bob. Thank you. Um, this is, this is, this is exactly the kind of stuff we're all looking Hello. No, let me ask you this. Let me ask yeah, you this. I lost you there for a minute. Yeah, yeah, Bob, would you be willing to come back and talk to us a second time? Sure. Okay. And and then because there's so many fascinating topics that we could talk about. Okay. Um, yeah, we're out of time. And um I think it's been I think it's been great that you were able to get on with us. I look forward to talking to you again. And of course, um, we both live here in the same area, so I will definitely yeah. see you again. So I want to thank you, Bob, for joining us. And I want to also thank um, my, my program manager, Patricia Wilkinson, yes. uh, for, for doing what she does behind the scenes. And uh, I want to thank all of our viewers. I hope you enjoy our program. And thank you, KGRA Digital Broadcasting. And I have to say that this is Dark Window. I am Jim Mann, your host, along with Dr. Robert Farrow. And thank you for joining us, and good night. Good night.